Welcome to Midlife Matters. I'm Marie, and each week I'm joined by my friends Julie and Mindy to talk about all the topics keeping women in the middle years up at night. Today we're talking about earning scholarships for college, and this isn't just for the academic or sporty kids. We're joined by Janet Addison, whose kids earned over $400,000 in scholarships. She's full of great advice and tips that you're not going to want to miss. Listeners, it's that time of year that brings a little pep in the step to mothers everywhere. It is back to school time. Are you feeling it, Julie and Mindy? Yes, we need to play our cheering for I'm a fan right now. Yes, or that Staples (laughs) commercial. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Yes. (laughs) This year, I have twins that are seniors, so my train of thought is naturally also gearing up for the whole college application process and all that needs to be done in this important year. And even though they're my fourth and fifth to go through this process, I still always feel like there's so much to learn and it's always changing. But one thing that has not changed is the need for these girls to get as much money in scholarships for college as possible because we did not hit the lottery in the last few years. (laughs) So we need those scholarship dollars. And so listeners, today we have a topic that is perfect for this time of year because we're talking with our friend Janet Addison, who became a pseudo expert on scoring scholarships for her own kids. And she's here to share her wisdom on how you can do it, too. And if your kids are not ready to apply, don't turn us off because anytime, anywhere that they are in high school, this is a good time to start preparing for how Mm -hmm. they can set themselves up to get as much of their college education paid for as possible. And longtime listeners may recognize Janet's voice today from our Moving in Midlife episode, which we aired last August in 2020. So she is a woman of many talents. Janet, welcome to Midlife Matters. Thank you. I'm so glad y'all asked me back. It's a delight to be here. I can't believe it's been a whole year. I know. So much has changed. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. But before we get into all the details, will you introduce yourself to listeners and tell them how you came to learn so much about scholarships? Well, I've got two kids who are now employed. One of them's married. So we, we got through high school. We got through college. And uh, they are now uh, doing their own their own thing. Um, but when my daughter was uh, about to be a senior, I guess the summer before her senior year, I met a friend at church who taught me how she got scholarships for her son. And it just blew my mind. And um, I decided I would try to get scholarships for her, uh, maybe kind of spend her senior year working on getting scholarships. Otherwise, I was going to have to go back to work Mm. after she started college to pay for it, Mm -hmm. which I was willing to do. But I thought, I'm just going to give this a try. Um, So a a friend showed me how to do this. And I uh, am kind of obsessive compulsive. So I jumped in deep and made it way more than we thought it was going to be. But anyway, it paid off for us. So it was time well spent. (laughs) That's amazing how like, well, I don't want to go back to work. So what can I do to not do that? (laughs) (laughs) Sounds highly motivating to me. Yes. Yes. There was ever a reason to get on the internet, I don't know what else, what else it would be. <laughs> but before we get started, let's answer a burning question that some listeners might be thinking, because might be thinking, oh, is this even applicable? My kid is not a straight A student. They're not a standout. Are there scholarships available for every kid, Janet? I want to say yes, because All scholarships are not just for straight A kids. There are scholarships for students specifically who make more average grades. Um, I've seen some for, you know, minorities, for students who work, um, for students who maybe fall into a lower financial status, people who uh, have certain kind of illnesses and disabilities. So I think there are scholarships for everyone. You might just have to work a little harder to find some of them, Mm -hmm. but um, nobody's going to get a scholarship if they don't apply for any. Mm -hmm. So part of the main thing is, first of all, you have to apply. And second of all, you have to apply early. You Mm -hmm. have to start thinking about this before everybody else does to get your name in the 
in the line quicker than than other people. And that's what I found really has made the difference is, you know, people who start earlier looking for money because the money does run out, you know, Mm -hmm. organizations and universities, they're on a budget too. And they run out of money just like everybody does. So the first ones to ask for it, get the money and the later ones sometimes don't. That's a great Mm -hmm. point. Could you be more specific about like, when would that practically be? So if your student is going to be a senior, like, do you need to be thinking about this their junior year? Do you need to, you know, when is the application process kind of the the prime time to, to be applying, I guess? Well, the good news, especially for Marie, is it is not too late yet if your kid is about. Oh, good. (laughs) Okay. Um, The better news would be if your kid's a freshman or a sophomore, because Mm. um, there are things you can start doing even when your kid's in ninth grade to help prepare for this, to make it an easier transition or an easier process. Ideally, like now in the summer, and um, y'all should be asking for people to write recommendation letters for your child, like teachers or coaches or bosses or things like that. Um, Building their resume, getting your tax information together because you have to submit your tax forms for a lot of scholarships. That's just part of it. So those kind of things you can be doing through the summer before they start school in the fall. You can also start figuring out what kind of essays they're going to write, um, thinking through, you know, what are my career goals? And a lot of scholarships kind of have two or three common prompts that I went on and had my kids write. And then we would just recycle those essays for every, um, every scholarship we applied for. So those kind of things you can be doing now. And then when school starts, um, you, you really ought – also ought to have had your top two or three schools selected already and kind of know what the requirements are, the deadlines are, the costs are, all those kind of hoops you're going to have to jump through. So when school starts, you're ready to start applying Mm. to the schools. Mm -hmm. Um, And you not only have to apply for admission, you have to apply for financial aid at each school too. Mm -hmm. So the earlier you apply, the the sooner you get in the queue mm-hmm. to get the balls rolling. Yeah. And I'll just say that, um, yes, you have to apply for financial aid, no matter what college you go to. This has been to even get the automatic ACT merit scholarships. You still have to fill out your FAFSA. You will probably never see a dime. Doesn't even matter if you want to see a dime and you know that you won't. Um, you have to fill it out or they won't give you those. So everyone who goes to college has to fill that out. Yes. But I don't think that really comes out until the spring. I don't think. I'm not sure. Well, I know when my kids were in school, it didn't open until January 1st okay. of their senior year. Now, I think it opens a couple of months sooner. Okay. Mm-hmm. Possibly even as early as October of mm-hmm. their senior year. Okay. Mm-hmm. Good to know. So, yeah. But I guess all that to say is even if you don't think you'll qualify for financial aid, you have to fill it out anyway. So you do, even to get work study or mm-hmm. you know, whatever. You're right. Gina, this seems like a daunting task to me. I remember seeing your big notebook. It was kind of a beast. <laughs> what? How do you how did you know what to do? How did you get started? Well, my friend showed me all the different types of scholarships that there were, and I just spent hours online. Every school that you apply to has a certain tier of scholarships. You know, if you make this ACT or this GPA, you qualify for this. If you make this, you you qualify for this. And then they have uh, departmental scholarships, which is a whole different area on the website outside of financial aid. Like if your kid's really good in chemistry, might get a chemistry department scholarship or uh, alumni scholarships. So each university has what they call institutional scholarship money available. And that is the easiest pot of money to tap into. And what I understand now is that it's more automatic than it used to be. Once you fill that stuff out, they will notify the students through their new university student email account saying, hey, you, you know, this is what you're, you're, we're wanting to offer you. And of course, you have to accept it. 
And then I started looking for what are called uh, private scholarships. Um, So institutional money can only be used at the school giving the scholarships. Private scholarships can be carried to whatever school your child decides to go to. And that would be like, you know, Walmart or Coca-Cola or if they work for Chick-fil-A or if uh, like my kids both got the Daughters of the American Revolution scholarships, you know, Rotary Club, Lions Club, those kind of things. Mm. And then the more you look, there are, you know, uh, like disability scholarships or scholarships with kids who have had cancer or leadership scholarships. You just start Googling um, you know, scholarships in my state, uh, scholarships for kids with blah, you know, whatever mm-hmm. pertains to your particular child. Um, there are also just random drawings that you have as much chance as anybody does to, to really? get money. Wow. Yeah. Did we, you we get any of those, money. Janet? We did not. We did <laughs> not. That would have been really easy. Um, so there are, the, that's what I did. I just Googled and Googled and Googled. And then... Julie mentioned my notebook. I live by notebooks. I had a, about a three and a half or four inch thick notebook. Oh my gosh. And when I would find a scholarship that I thought we might be interested in applying for, I would file it under a tab in the notebook that corresponded with the month that it was due. So I had a September tab, a October, November, December, whatever. Mm. So when it was due, I would file it under that tab. So I would know, you know, I don't have to deal with this one right this minute. I can wait. Um, So then in the front of the notebook, I had copies of her resume, of all the recommendation letters, transcript, tax documents, essays, all that kind of stuff. So when I went to apply for a scholarship, I would pull whatever documents out of my notebook that the particular scholarship required I would customize our cover letter template for that particular scholarship. I would put it in a clear plastic um, report cover type folder because I always go overboard on details like that. Mm -hmm. And then I put it in an envelope. Well, usually I would leave all this stuff on the kitchen table. I would do this at night. I would leave it on the kitchen table. And as Mabry walked out of the house in the morning, she'd sign all her letters. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then I would put it all in the notebook. I mean, in the, in the envelope and mail it off. And then I would file the um, application back in the notebook with the date I mailed it. And then later, you know, whatever the result was, if she didn't get it or we did or whatever, I'd, I'd make note of that. Wow. Well, that leads right into my next question. Of, I was going to ask you, Janet, did you get your kids involved in this process? Because it sounds very much like this is almost a full-time job for you. Yeah. I How did you handle it that? a full-time job for me. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because, you know, Mabry wasn't going to have to pay for college, so it really didn't bother her <laughs> how the money got there. <laughs> uh, but she did uh, She did write the essays. She did uh, ask the people to write letters of recommendation for her. She did the college visits and made her list of where she wanted to go. I edited everything. I hunted for all the scholarships and gathered the stuff. And then when the kids did get an award, I made them write thank you notes to the people that were giving Ooh. them. Yeah. Mm, well, that's, that's a good idea. That's so idea. now my son was much more involved because Mabry would kind of write it and then I would edit. I'm an editor. So, you know, I would edit it. Mm. But when it was my son's turn. He said, mom, I don't want you to change in a word. I said, okay. You know, and he would say, no, I'm not going to apply for that. He was much more in control of his thing than Mabry was. But um, yes, they were involved. But you're exactly right, Janet. Whoever is paying for the the bill is the one that needs to be probably most involved. In- <laughs> yes, yeah. because I've had other people say, "Oh, would you teach my child how to do this?" And I've said, "Sure," but the kids really aren't. They're not that motivated. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right, yeah, unless they're paying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Janet, could you help just direct us, where did you find all of the information for the scholarships? How did you know where to even look for it? First of all, I need to say one thing that I think is really important. 
I think parents do kids a disservice by by uh, being rabid football fans their whole life. And this kid grows up thinking, oh, I'm going to go to Alabama because I love Alabama <laughs> football or whatever. Um, when you might not really be able to afford sending to send your kid to Alabama or, or wherever. So we only considered schools that we could afford with scholarships. Okay. For example, when my husband was a pastor, every pastor's family we knew in our state sent their kid to the same Baptist university. So we looked at that, but even with all the scholarships Mabry had on her own and what the school was going to give her, even for her academic or for her pastor's kid discount, Mm -hmm. we were still going to have to pay $10,000 a year to send her to that school. So we crossed it off the list. So Mm -hmm. parents need to, you know, when I need a new car, I don't go to the Mercedes dealership. I go to the Ford place. Mm -hmm. That's the way you need to approach colleges, because if you have your heart set on an out-of-state school, that's going to double your cost. Mm -hmm. So make sure you're looking at schools that are really what you can afford that will meet your child's career needs. Secondly, Mm -hmm. we applied for both types, the institutional scholarships, which is the money given by a university to be used at that school and uh, private scholarships, which are corporate or charitable organizations You can check the college websites for that. But another good uh, resource is the high school guidance counselors. And Mm -hmm. it is part of their job to help your kid get to college Mm -hmm. and help you find scholarships. And I had uh, I became very good friends with the guidance counselor at our school uh, because she said I sometimes would grab kids in the hallway and make them apply for these scholarships because mm-hmm. there was money going unused because mm-hmm. the kids just wouldn't bother to come in and apply for it. Mm-hmm. So, and I even got on the high schools of other cities. Like I even looked when we lived in Arkansas, I looked at Nashville high school uh, guidance counselor Uh, lists of scholarships because I wanted to make sure I was finding the most number that I could find. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and then I, I started after I started into this for a while, I learned to determine is the work that I've got to put into trying for this scholarship going to pay out enough to be worth the trouble. Mm -hmm. You know, if I had to write, get her to write a new essay and all she was going to win was $500, we didn't even bother for that. Mm -hmm. But if it was a a scholarship, you know, some scholarships are one-time awards um, and a lot of what freshmen get are one-time awards. Mm -hmm. But then there are some scholarships that pay every single year as long as you um, Mm -hmm. meet certain requirements. So, you know, I would work harder on Mm -hmm. a big payoff. So, and that's why, you know, we applied for 44 scholarships for our first child. (gasps) And with our second child, we only did around 20 because then I realized what was worth the trouble and what was 44 scholarships. (laughs) I remember uh, getting some advice when we were going through this process, like, Oh, you might not want to apply for the Coca-Cola scholarship because literally hundreds of thousands of people will be applying for that. So look for those smaller, more obscure, more specific. So I think that um, it sounds like Mm -hmm. that's what you did. Yeah. So I guess maybe a misconception is you hear, I got a scholarship, but it sounds like you got scholarships and you piecemealed. That's exactly what we did. And so it all added up. Yes. And I went I think when you go do college visits with your child, you should make an appointment for just you and your child. I don't like those big uh, college event days when your kid is there with a hundred other people. So when you go uh, by yourselves like that for a college visit, they get to know your kid. Your child gets a better feeling of if you like these professors or whatever. And that gives you an opportunity to make an appointment with the financial aid people at the college, Um, not the kid that sits at the front desk, but the adult who sits in the back Mm -hmm. office is who you want to talk to. Because I had a conversation with that lady at my daughter's school who not only explained the whole cost of attendance thing to me which we need to talk about that in a minute. But she also said, and you will not find this in writing anywhere, but both of my kids went to different schools and this 
played out both times. There is a an allowance that it lets you exceed the the maximum limit your freshman year um, to get a computer. So both of my kids got enough scholarship money to uh, apply toward uh, MacBook computers and printers. But again, if I hadn't had that conversation with the financial aid lady in person, she just mentioned that in passing. And uh, so I think it's very valuable to talk to the people at Mm. the school who are in charge of giving out money because you want them to know your name. Mm -hmm. So you're saying your kids were awarded more money than the cost of attendance, and they were able to use that on computers. Correct. Because by federal law, there is there is a limit as to what you can bring in. I think it's federal law, some law. There is a limit, a cap. But what you need to understand is your goal should be to fund cost of attendance, not just tuition, not just dorm costs, because every school has you know, tuition listed, dorm costs listed. And then when you add on books, travel, miscellaneous expenses, that's usually about the cost of attendance is usually about $5,000 more than just what tuition and room and board is. You know, that's even a higher number for like community colleges. And Mm -hmm. when students live at home with your parents, if you're living at home with your parents and still commuting to college, you've still got gas expenses and all that kind of stuff. So the goal is not to cover tuition. The goal is to cover cost of attendance. Wow. And the power of that is every single semester, my kids were fully funded at cost of attendance level. So about three weeks into the semester, we got a refund check because they send you back the money that you had that's the overage from tuition and room and board and cost of attendance. So every year or every semester, we got a check back and I would deposit that money and then I would eke it back into my kids' accounts throughout the semester for their spending money. Hmm. Well, okay, this is where we need to play the I'm a fan applause for Janet. This is, <laughs> yes. Oh my I goodness. feel like the biggest failure right now. <laughs> yeah, she got paid to send her kids to school. You hear that? <laughs> well, we did. And- I, I don't know. It was I good just, job. Well, that was yes. fun. that was just a blessing the Lord gave us at that time that we needed it. Yeah, yeah. Let me clarify, Janet. So, if you were applying for private scholarships, they'll let you use that towards your tuition or your room and board because most institutional scholarships just cover the cost of tuition. Um, every scholarship is different. Some of them do not care. Um, some scholarships will send the check to the kid. I know my son got one that was just like a check mm-hmm. and he could do whatever he wanted to do. He could buy an Xbox with it if he wanted to. Mm-hmm. Some of them, most of them are written to the school and your students. Mm. And some of them say this can only be used for room and board or this can only be used for tuition mm-hmm. or some of them don't care. Okay. So whoever's giving out the money has the right to tell you how you have to use it. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Because it's true that like a lot of times, if you're just going based on academic scholarships, like you said, with the ACT scores and the grades, um, you think, oh, well, it's almost all paid for. But you forget that room and board is Mm -hmm. at least $5,000 a semester. And, you know, that's going to be money you have to spend. Parking pass was Mm -hmm. $600 a year. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, things like that. You, you don't think about it. Somebody's got to pay for that. Sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot yeah. of hidden cost. There are. You've already mentioned essays, Janet. Uh, tell us a little bit about what the typical application looks like. Do they all require essays? And um, how do you get your kid to, to write a good essay? <laughs> that is a good question, especially as a college writing professor. My first answer is if they can't write a decent essay, for a scholarship, then they're not going to be able to do very well in college because the very first class they take in college is freshman English, where all you do is write essays. So if they don't want to, you know, make them do it, pay them to do it, whatever it is you <laughs> need to, to, to. But um, I think we wrote like two. One of them was a career goals essay because that's what most 
most uh, essay prompts at the time we were doing this asked for, you know, what do you want to do with your life and why? Sometimes there's uh, there was one that uh, overcoming a difficult hardship. They want to make sure, I mean, scholarship committees are just like all of us. When we give money to something, we want to make sure we're getting value for our money. And so the purpose of the essay is to convince them that your student has the maturity, the character, the grit that it's going to take to succeed in college. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whatever they're writing about, they need to make sure they're showing personal examples of, you know, how they overcame something or how they learned to be grateful for something or how something led to personal growth, you know, those kind of things. So um, sometimes I saw prompts that said, you know, how do you define success? Um, What person has most impacted your life? Uh, But really, the career goals and overcoming a difficult time in your life kind of were the the ones that we, I mean, my kids had a limit too. They were only going to write two essays. So I could only apply for scholarships (laughs) that would accept those essay prompts. Well, I'm just laughing because I just went through this last year with my son that goes to college next week. And from the prompts, we picked a hardship you've overcome. Okay, he has never been like, drastically sick. Nobody close to him has died. He hasn't had um, to move out of his house. Like there just hasn't been anything super hard. And it was really (laughs) hard to write for him to write that essay. And I won't even tell you what he picked because it's (laughs) kind of laughable. But anyways, I would he would write like he wrote like a rough draft. And so then I'm trying to expand the paragraphs and sending it back to him and saying, can you write three more sentences in this paragraph? I have nothing else to say. And I'm like, I know I have nothing else to, but you know, try to come up with something in your brain. You know, I don't even care how you embellish it. These essays are harder than they look, Janet. Yes, they are. Especially if you're not sure what you, what your career goals are, you know, it's like, does that mean I don't need a scholarship if I don't know? What yes. What if you're undeclared? Yet? <laughs> well, and Mabry changed her major about three times, so it's like... You just make something up and go with it? <laughs> well, something that is a reason, I, I would never say make it up or lie, but something that is a reasonable direction mm-hmm. that your child has talked about possibly going into. <laughs> um, you know, but I mean, any of their English teachers would be thrilled to help them write this essay. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, everybody wants your child to succeed at college and to succeed uh, getting scholarships. Yeah, yeah. And another thing for the scholarships, um, sometimes you have to send in recommendations that have never been opened. They're like directly from the person. And you said you put all Mm -hmm. yours in your notebook. How did you do that? I specifically remember Mabry got one from, a, a, I think it was from a doctor because Mabry had had some health issues. And she just printed off multiple copies and put them in sealed envelopes and sent them to me that way. And okay, sometimes the doctor did or maybe yeah, did. Okay. The doctor, the did, doctor okay. sent them to us. Okay. And sometimes transcripts have to be like mm-hmm. notarized and sealed. So, and I think we had to buy those from the school mm-hmm. office for like a dollar a piece. But yeah, I just would, I had all the documents like that I needed. Okay. Yeah, because um, it really is daunting for kids to even go and ask their teacher, some kids to even ask their teacher for recommendations. And then some of the teachers, they say like, okay, I'm willing to write 10 recommendations this year. And if when I'm full, I'm full. So you need to get in there at the beginning of the year and say, yes, Mr. You know, English composition teacher that I love, put me on your list to write a recommendation. Because if once he fills up, he's not going to do any more. Right. Or ask them in the summer when yep, you know, everybody knows teachers don't do anything in the summer. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> that was a joke, by the way. <laughs> I wouldn't even dare contact a teacher in the summer. I would feel like that was contacting them after hours. <laughs> well, that's true. But. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of work. Like, your kids had to do work even even though they weren't doing even though you were doing more work there's still a lot of work that kids have to do yeah so what Mm -hmm. if you already have a job how are you supposed to get your kids to do all this work well that is a parenting episode that y'all need (laughs) she's already mentioned paying i'm I'm hearing like threatening bribery (laughs) i will be taking your car keys until this application is done sit down and make sure they understand the kind of money that we're talking about. I mean, Mm -hmm. this is a whole lot of money. 
And yes, kids can take out loans, but I have paid off student loans. That is not fun. Mm-mm. And that should not be your first, that shouldn't be the first thing, first resort. It should right. be a last resort and as little as possible. Right, right. Okay, Janet, so um, let's hear what you got for all of your hard work. Can you share some results, some specifics? Well, we applied for 44 with Mabry since I have got rid of my notebook in the last move. I can't tell you how many of those we got. Okay. Um, and we applied for about 20 for my son. But combined, they got uh, awarded over $435,000. That's wow. amazing, so Janet. That, that is like my son <laughs> got a free ride to two colleges for four years, um, you know, plus that they, they, they just had tons and tons of money. Now, not like we got $435,000, but all totaled up, that's how much they won. That is amazing. And you would not have been able to go to work most likely and make $400,000, right? <laughs> probably not. <laughs> probably not. All of my years working together, probably. Would. <laughs> well, that is awesome. I mean, it really was worth it. And I'm super impressed. Yes. Well, it worked for us. Mm-hmm. Oh, my goodness. What a wealth of information you have. Gosh. Yes. I'm going to have more questions for you, Janet, as we enter into this again, like in a few years. Well, I'd be happy to tell you what I know. <laughs> now, listeners, Janet is just a private person, so she does not have like this scholarship how to website to link to, but she is willing to give out her email here on Midlife Matters. So, Janet, will you give us your email? And if you want to personally contact her with questions or advice or just what she did, clarifications, anything you want, she's willing to email you back. Janet, what is your email? My email is Janet Addison, J A N E T A D D I S O N, at me, M E dot com. And I do have handouts and things like that that I can, I can email people if they are interested. Yes. Well, I don't know who wouldn't be interested in getting free college. I mean, really? (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Especially when you hear that dollar amount. That's just, I'm still taken aback by that. (laughs) I know. That is awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, Janet, before we go, uh, we definitely like to do I'm a Fan. And we always let our guests go first. So, Janet, what are you a fan of this week? I am a fan of these pear eyewear glasses. I uh, fell prey to an Instagram ad. and That's why you're Julie's friend, that, right? <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. But um, I was adding up today. I have worn glasses for 45 years, and these actually make me happy. I have a base pair of glasses. I bought clear. And then there are these magnetic colored toppers. <gasps> That you just pop on. Amazing. And there's, I mean, they even have Harry Potter plaids. There's <laughs> all kinds of things. And sunglasses. Oh. Things. So it has made me so happy. And I could have sold a thousand pairs of these just from people seeing me clip them on and off. So this is one of those million dollar ideas that I'm kicking myself that I didn't come up with. Yes. But it's pair, P A I R, eyewear. Yes, oh, and amazing. listeners, you can't see Janet, um, <laughs> but basically she has clear rims and you can then magnetically hook on colored rims over them and it looks just like they're part of the glasses and she was able to just hook on her sunglasses. So definitely we'll put a link to this in our show notes. For anyone that wears glasses, it gives you so many more options. Yeah, yes. and Janet's always been known by her stylish glasses. I am, well, when you wear them every day for years and years and years, you have to make them interesting and fun. Yes. All right. Wow. Well, Julie, what are you a fan of this week? I'm a fan of a podcast that I discovered on a road trip that we were just on. Um, And you know, I love the Olympics. It's my favorite two weeks of the summer. And this was um, a short podcast. I think it's about five short episodes. And it's about the women's gymnastics all around finals at the 2000 summer games in Sydney. Mm. And the tagline is that it reveals the it, it reveals the untold true story of one of the biggest mistakes in Olympic history. And mm. it's nothing sinister. It's nothing about the um, sexual abuse scandal. It's just a mistake mm. that was made oh, and how it affected all the athletes and how they dealt with it. And the story was 
never really told. Well, how many oh, episodes wow. is it, Julie? There's just five. And they're okay. about, I think the longest is 20 minutes. So I had it on double speed. You know, I got oh, through the wow. whole thing really quickly. <laughs> and who are the famous names from that year? Because that's kind of how I remember things. So who was in the Olympic Games that year for gymnastics? You know, I did not recognize the names. Oh, you didn't? Okay, so it's no, no. one that we would still recognize today. No. And unfortunately, I think it's because what happened there. Um, oh. Ooh. <laughs> okay. I, I don't want to spoil it, but yeah. It has right. the mistake. <laughs> yes. Well, what's the podcast called again? It's called Blind Landing. All right. Well, that sounds interesting. So if anyone needs a quick five episode, 20 minute each podcast, that sounds like a good one. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Mindy, what are you a fan of this week? This week, I'm a fan of an app that I have found myself looking at and really enjoying daily. Um, the name of it is Chris Loves Julia. Mm. And this, um, they started a blog actually years ago. And so they have a huge following already. And I've just found them through another decorating app. But basically, um, they do like home renovation. They share things on decorating. Um, you When you're decorating on a budget, she'll do like a daily dupe. So she'll show an item that's like really expensive versus an item that's really cheap that you can find. Mm. Um, I have already even ordered rugs off of Amazon that they have designed. So um, I've gotten a couple of beautiful rugs based on their recommendation. And then I was like, oh, wow, it's their line that they worked with. So anyways, they've been out there for a while, but they're a sweet family. Like it's very positive. It's enjoyable. Um, also, Janet, you and I have moved a lot. They have just moved. And so she shares like how they're renovating a new home right now. And it is so enjoyable. The content that she shares that that they share every day. It's really impressive. So it's called Chris Loves Julia. And it's an app on Instagram. Okay, now, Mindy, you said that they have an app, but do you mean that it's an Instagram account? I'm so sorry. I'm so. This is how good I am. Tech, technol. I'm so. She can't, can't even say, say the word technological. Word. I'm so bad at technology. Chris loves Julia is a blog, but it, this is an Instagram page that I follow. Did okay. I say that right? Okay. Is it called a page? An Instagram? It's an account. It's an account. An account. account. See, that's yes. what it is. <laughs> Okay. All right. Follow Chris Loves Julia. On Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> At Chris Loves Julia. <laughs> All right. No, I have read their blog and also follow them on Instagram and they do have a lot of good oh. ideas. And I think they did just move to like maybe North Carolina or North something. North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So that's cool. That's real cool. All right. I'm a fan of a book and maybe you have read it being an English teacher, Janet. Have you read American Dirt? If it's not Regency fiction, no, I have not read it. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I tr I picked this book up. It came out um, last year. It was actually one of Oprah's Oprah's book club books. So it was on mm. all the new book lists. And I picked it up last year. And they said it was going to be so riveting. And I just couldn't get more than a few pages into it. But this year, I decided to try the audio book. And I really did enjoy it. So if mm. you try to read it and you don't like it, maybe try the audiobook. I thought it was really well done, um, the actress that did it. But anyways, it's a 2020 novel by American author Janine Cummins about the ordeal of a Mexican woman who had to leave behind her life and escape as an undocumented immigrant to the United States with her son. Now, this is a fictional story, but what stories like this do to do for me is kind of give me maybe a who or a why or a what. And all we ever hear about, well, not all we ever hear about, but uh, but we hear often about the crisis at the border. But this mm -hmm. was interesting to learn why someone might be trying to get across the border illegally, what they might go through to get across the border, um, mm -hmm. why they left their country. And so it was just a, it was interesting to me to read um the process and what they went through and it raises a lot of questions. So it's a good story. And I really think it's like something that would be great to read in a book club and have a great discussion. Wow. All right. Yeah. So it's uh, fictional, but it kind of reads like nonfiction. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Janet, thanks so much for joining us today. We are so happy to talk with you. and so inspired. Thank you, Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. 
Yes. Thanks Thank again you. for coming on. I can't wait to have you again. I know. What will you talk about the third time you come on, Janet? Yeah, she's so organized. I want her to teach me how to organize everything. That's what she should talk about is home organization. Oh, okay. Ooh. Goodness. <laughs> well, I mean, she did say how organized she was about those scholarships. Mm-hmm. That's right. For sure. All yep. right. <laughs> All right, listeners, come and find us on Instagram this week at Midlife Matters Podcast. We will link to Janet's account on there and be sure and email her. Give that email one more time, Janet. Janet Addison at me.com. Janet Addison at me.com if you have any questions or you want her to email you any handouts. All right, Janet, thanks for joining us and we'll talk to you guys next week. Okay. Hey, bye-bye. Bye. Bye, bye girls. We're so happy you joined us today. You can find the show notes for this episode at midlifematterspodcast.com. Also, please tell a friend about the show and help them hit the free subscribe button on their favorite podcast app. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Midlife Matters Podcast. That's where we post pictures and stories about all the things we talk about in each episode. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.